Okay, everybody, welcome. Um, ready or not, this is how we're going to be doing things for the next few weeks. So let's get started with our Lab 11 tutorial. This will be just a brief overview of how to start Lab 11, some of the main important points of it. This lab is going to be due by Friday, March 27th, before 11.59 p.m. So um, what I want to point out to you for some of these new things as we're getting into the swing of how this is going to work, if you go into the front page of Carmen and go to assignments and go down to each of the individual labs. So here we're starting with lab eight now, as we're picking up again, there will be a lab tutorial video. I'll post a link here to a YouTube video where this, this that you're watching now will be posted. So this will happen every week. The lab assignment will be posted here that you can find. And then lab discussion will be this link here. If you go to that link, that's where you will post questions that you have about the labs. You can talk about it with each other. You can ask us questions. And of course, you can log into off virtual office hours as you need to throughout the semester as, as you need to. So I ask, and, and we will return the favor, but I ask that you are patient with us in these first couple weeks as everybody kind of figures out how this works. And again, we understand that your lives have been uprooted as well. I have been, you know, to be honest, I've been pretty stressed out the last few days and I didn't even have to find a new lease or change my housing situation or move out of the country or anything like that. And many of you have done that. We understand that. And so it, we're asking for your flexibility and, and I wanna reassure you that as, as strict and as uptight as I have been in the past, and I acknowledge that, I totally understand that what we're going through now is not something that I've ever seen, not something that many of you have ever seen. So we know that that uh, this is a time for us to be flexible as well. You know, I want to emphasize that that's within reason. So don't abuse that, please. But we understand that this is a tough time for everybody. With all that being said, though, I'm confident that we're going to have a good semester here to wrap this all up. And so let's get started. Let's just get right back to it. I think that's the best way to, to start our new normal here now. So again, what I have here now is for lab 11. I'm gonna bring up the lab exercise here that you can get on Carmen. And so the goal of this lab is to show you how the coverage for confidence intervals works when we use the pooled variance. That's what problem one is. So how does the pooled variance work? And then problem two is about the width of the confidence interval. So we've talked about confidence intervals in two contexts. Number one, how often does the confidence interval capture the true parameter that we want it to capture? And we've done Monte Carlo simulations with that to see if our true parameter was inside or outside. We did that with a true or a false in R to see if our parameter was in the interval or not. When we get to problem two, we're going to think about the width of the confidence interval itself. So the way I've heard confidence intervals described is with an analogy of it's like a fishnet. When you are out in a boat fishing, you see a fish jump out of the water. And so you have a glimpse of where you think that fish is. So the fish is the parameter we want to catch, but that little glimpse you saw of it jumping out of the water is the statistic you observed. That's the snapshot of the population that you have, and it might not be a perfect guess as to the fish's actual whereabouts, but it gives you an idea of where it is. So a confidence interval is when you take a net and you throw it out of your boat and you just throw it into the water where you saw the fish jump out of the water, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to catch it. You take this net and you throw it out of the boat and you try to capture the true parameter, the true fish. Um, but the thing is with that net, you want the net to be as small as you can make it so that you are still capturing the fish 95% of the time or whatever one minus alpha percent of the time you're designing your interval for. Because if we have a bigger net, that's gonna be impractical. And we've talked about that in lecture about how, you know, for example, I can say, with 99% confidence that we're gonna to have to be locked up in our homes for another two to eight months. Now I have high confidence in that, but that's kind of a scary and impractical thing to say between two and eight months, you know, that could be anything. So we can, we want our interval that I give you to be as narrow as I can make it. Well, maybe it's gonna be two to three months. Um, we want it to be as narrow as we can make it, but we still wanna maintain the level of confidence that we have. So that width of the interval is what we're gonna be investigating in problem two. So, all right, let me uh, switch over here now. All right, so with problem one, that is about two normal populations with distinct 
uh, I'm sorry, with equal variances. And so because we just have that one variance, we're gonna use one estimator, one parameter to estimate what that is. So let me show you what I mean here. So in problem one, we have a population A, which is normally distributed with some U A and some variance sigma squared. And we have a population B, which is normally distributed with some U B and some variance squared. So I wanna emphasize here that I don't have a sigma squared A and a sigma squared B because we're assuming that the variances are equal to each other. So we just have one single unknown variance parameter. And so that means, you know, I can use two unbiased estimators for mu a and mu b. Mu at a is going to be x bar a. That seems like a reasonable estimator to use. And then mu at b is going to be x bar b. So that shouldn't come as a surprise that we're using these unbiased estimators as my individual mean estimators. I don't need to sigma squared estimators. I just need a single one, sigma hat squared, because a and b have the same variance. And this is where I'm going to use the pooled variance, that thing that we talked about. So s squared pooled is then going to be my one single estimator of the variance. Now, I'll drop hints to people who are actually going to take the time to watch these videos. I'm going to ask you about making a confidence interval with the pooled variance on your exam, too. That's coming on Wednesday. So make sure you know how to make an interval out of this. So if this is my one estimator, I need to compute the pooled variance. So what you're going to do for your lab, I'll come back to you. So what you're going to do for your lab then is generate 30 observations from your two normal populations. So I give you some parameters to use here, mu a equals 20, mu b equals 25, and a common variance of nine for both. So that's what you're going to do for step one. Remember, we're trying to show that the coverage works well when we use the pooled variance. Step two is going to be compute the pooled variance estimates from your sample. So then the pooled variance, as a reminder, is S squared pooled is the weighted average of the two individual sample variances. So that's S squared A times NA minus 1 plus S squared B times NB minus 1 over NA plus NB minus 2. So that's the weighted average of the two individual. You get two statistics from your two individual samples, and you take the weighted average. And then that's your one universal estimate for the one unknown sigma squared. So I'm going to share my screen again. OK, so that's step two then. So step one, you're going to generate a sample from those two normal distributions. Step two, you're gonna compute the pooled variance the way that I just did. Step three, you're gonna compute your 95% confidence interval based on that pooled variance and T distribution. So where does the T distribution come into play here? Remember, something I've been talking about all along is that if you can write the sampling distribution of your own biased estimator, it will tell you what the confidence interval looks like. So in this case, we have our X bar A minus X bar B minus mu a minus mu b over the square root of s squared pooled over n a plus s squared pooled over n b follows a t distribution with n a plus n b minus 2. So I've written, here's my unbiased estimator with the difference in the x bars. Here's my true means. I standardize it by the variance. I can get that sampling distribution of the t. So out of this, then we can build the confidence interval x bar a minus x bar b plus or minus t and so the t has to be related to alpha over 2 and then my degrees of freedom n a plus n b minus 2. So this is all in the subscript here I want to emphasize times then the square root of my s squared pooled over n a plus s squared pooled over n b. So this is then the confidence interval and we've seen this before right so I'm trying to review this a little bit we've definitely seen this before but this is then your one minus alpha percent confidence interval for the true for the difference in means. We build it with this unbiased difference in the estimators, the t distribution, and then the pooled variance. We're using the pooled variance because I'm assuming the variances are equal, and I just need one estimator for both of those. So uh, let me share again. So what you're going to do then in step three is to compute the confidence interval the way I just showed you. Store whether the confidence interval contains the true difference in means. Now keep in mind for this problem, I told you to use a true mu a equals 20 and a true mu b equals 25. So if I want to do 
mu b, I'm sorry, mu a minus mu b, the true difference in these means is negative five. So that's going to be what you're checking to see whether it falls in your interval or not. Think back how we did this in lecture and look back to the old lecture code about how we check to see whether that value falls inside the interval or not. Repeat this many times as we do in Monte Carlo studies to see whether we get 95% coverage. When you're, uh, one thing I want to point out with the code, when the variance is nine, when you're using R norm to generate normal data, make sure you use three as your standard deviation because that's the argument that R is expected when you do the R norm. So for number two, I'm just going to go ahead and do 2A with you to get you started. So we'll investigate the width of the confidence intervals as opposed to the coverage. So for problems two, I want to ask you to investigate how your confidence intervals width is going to change in each of these four cases. When you have more or fewer observations, when you have higher or lower variance, when you have higher or lower alpha, when you have higher or lower mu, how does the width of the interval change? So think about this from the fish analogy. If I have more data, let's see, suppose I've seen the fish jump out of the water more times, that means I have a better guess as to where it actually is. Do I need to cast a wider or a smaller net to capture the fish if I have more data about it? Well, intuitively, hopefully you're thinking, I don't need as large of a net. I, have, I can use a smaller net because with more data, I have more uh, knowledge about where the fish is and I have less variability in where I believe the fish is. So our intuition should tell us that with more observations, my interval should get narrower. With fewer observations, the interval should get wider. And keep in mind that the coverage is still gonna be 95% no matter what. So let's code this up then. Um, let's see here. So um, I'm sharing my screen, right? Yeah, okay. So in step one, as I have in your lab here, generate n observations with mu and sigma squared. So you're gonna be adjusting these for each of the four problems. So let's just let n equal 10 mu equal, what did we say it was before, 20, and sigma squared, or I'll do sigma to standard deviation, be 3. We'll do 5,000 Monte Carlo samples. And remember, what I need to store here, I'm not storing the coverage, I'm storing the widths of each interval. So I'm going to say widths equals rep NA NMC, which is where I'm going to store the width of each interval. So what I need to do in my Monte Carlo loop then, is first compute some data. So how about x equals r norm? I'm gonna generate n observations with a mu of three and a standard deviation of three. I'm sorry, a mu of 20 and a standard deviation of three. Then I need to compute the confidence interval from that. So remember how we do this with just one at a time. So I need my x bar is gonna be the mean of my sample. I need my s squared, which is gonna be the variance of my sample. And then my lower limit is going to be x bar plus qt of, what was my alpha? I never set one. Let me go back up outside my loop and set an alpha level. We'll start with 0.05 for this one. So I need to find the t related to alpha over 2 with degrees of freedom equal to n minus 1. So let's just uh, check and see what that is and make sure we're doing that right. Qt of alpha over 2n minus 1. Remember, it's got a minus built in with it. So even though the lower limit usually is x bar minus that, I have the plus with the built in minus sign. So it really is x bar minus t times the standard deviation then, which is going to be the square root of my s squared divided by n. So this is s over the square root of n there as well. So here's my lower limit. My upper limit is going to be almost the same thing, my ul except I need to do QT of one minus alpha over two. So alpha over two is the 0.025. One minus alpha over two is the 97.5. So keep in mind between those two values is the 95% confidence that I want for the interval. So there's my lower and my upper limit. So then the width is gonna be the absolute value of my upper limit minus my lower limit. So that will tell me how wide my confidence interval is. And then I need to store that width. Actually, why don't I just do that all in one step? I'll say widths i equals the, the width of that interval. So, okay, I think we've got this all set up now. Let's run the whole chunk and see what my widths look like. 
And so here's the width of each interval. You can see some are wider than others. That's because in some of the intervals, each one's based on a different data set. So that means each one is going to have a different variability. Each one is going to be a little bit wider or a little bit narrower than each other. So my question is, though, how are the widths going to change when n is small or large? So let's try this again. What's my average width so far? So when n equals 10, my average width for my 5,000 confidence intervals was 4.155. Okay, so let's do this again. I'm going to change n to 50. So with more data, what's going to happen? I'm just going to copy my code from previously. All I'm going to change is n. I'm going to keep sigma and alpha and everything else the same because I want to see how just changing the n affects my width of my interval. So when n is 50 now, let's see what the mean of my widths is. 1.69. Okay, so remember what our intuition was before. With more data, there's less uncertainty, meaning my net that I'm going to cast to catch the fish, my interval that I'm going to cast to capture the true parameter, doesn't have to be as wide to hit the mark as often. So I think the answer we've seen here about the average width of the intervals makes sense. I'm getting narrower intervals with more data because with more data is more confidence. I don't have to make the... Um, I don't have to make my interval as wide to be as to still maintain. There's still 95% coverage here, but I don't have to make the interval as wide to get that coverage with more data. So that should hopefully get you started with lab one. Again, please be patient with us as we get this all up and running for the semester. This has been tough. Um, this has been tough on your professors too. But you know, most of the time, I'm like at the end of the list for all these emails that people are getting. I'm finding out last that the semester was extended and that this was all happening anyway. So um, I appreciate your patience. And again, I, I offer you my patience and understanding as well this semester. Um, please, with the discussion page, post not only your questions about the lab, if you have them, but also suggestions. Again, this is the first time I've done this here like this. I've got my dining room set up. I've got lights in the proper place. So I'm trying to avoid glares and everything like that. But if there's something that I can do with these videos that you think would make them easier to follow, more informative, more helpful, please let me know because we got to do this for a few weeks, right? I want this to be as helpful and accommodating to all you guys as I can. So thanks for your attention and your patience and everything. And I will, I wish I would see you again. I, I miss you guys already for what it's worth. Um, but I guess I'll talk to you next time for the next lecture assignment. And uh, let me know if you have questions. We'll be flexible with office hours too. Thank you.